Seek your truth. Mute. Good morning, Peter. Good morning, Gilad. Good, Good morning. We got Kathy made the hot spot for me, so I can hello, hello. see you, Bill. Hi. I guess or see something. Hello. Yeah. Hi, Bill. Hi, Bill. So. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Hey. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Okay, we'll try to see if this stays up now. All right. Okay. See Bye -bye. you later. Bye, Duke. So, Gilad, if I switch to the website now, you still see Bill's slide, right? Yes, we can see it. Cool. Okay. So, you don't see the website. No, no, we no, I, no, you're seeing the website, not these lights. Yeah, but you're seeing our cover slide, that's what I mean. Yes. Yeah, good. So I guess we'll wait another minute or so and then we'll go in. Okay, Gilad Hagen, what do you think? Shall we start? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. So then uh, I would like to welcome all of you. Thank you for joining us again for our webinar series on protein folding and dynamics. And it is my particular pleasure today to welcome Bill Eaton as our speaker. And Bill, as you know, uh, has been a real driving force in the field for a long time and in several remarkable ways, the few aspects that I would like to mention before he starts. So the first thing is that the bill has always pushed the limits in terms of what is possible experimentally, uh, especially by developing and applying new physical techniques. So for example, he pioneered rapid laser spectroscopy for studying elementary processes in protein folding and aggregation also the use of, of single molecule spectroscopy in the field. But another distinguishing feature of Bill's work is the close link to theory and simulation, which helped to build a lot of bridges that weren't really there far into the 1990s. And many of the, the questions that he addressed were inspired, in fact, by the theoretical developments in the protein folding field, and in turn, his work also greatly inspired theory and simulation. He used a lot of theory to interpret and understand experiments in his group, but also some of the systems that he studied experimentally are now 
uh, the most widely used benchmarks, for instance, for ND simulations of protein folding. And another aspect that has always impressed me a lot about Bill is that he has often managed to set new trends in the field by asking new questions, which then often became major research topics in the field. The first example that I want to mention um, dates back to his early work on sickle cell disease, where he and his colleagues studied the aggregation of sickle cell hemoglobin with laser spectroscopy. And to explain this incredible concentration dependence of the aggregation kinetics of sickle cell hemoglobin, they came up with the idea of heterogeneous nucleation, which essentially means that new aggregates can nucleate on the surface of existing minerals. Among other things, this concept allowed them to explain essentially single molecule aggregation experiments that they did in the early 1980s and that are conceptually actually not unrelated to single channel recordings. And this concept of heterogeneous nucleation is now uh, widely used to explain amyloid aggregation. And so it's, it's really been an important idea. And sickle cell disease is now again, a, a major topic in Bill's current research, where he's now identifying a cure for the disease in his, in his latest work. But today, uh, Bill will focus on protein folding. And also there, he nucleated ideas that have had a strong and lasting impact in our field. Uh, for instance, <clears throat> the idea to dissect protein folding with uh, what he called an Aufbau approach. So the idea was to study elementary steps of the protein folding process, secondary structure formation, contact formation, on time scales down to the nanosecond range, which, which was simply inaccessible before. Closely connected is another idea, which is the idea of a speed limit in protein folding, a term that he coined and used frequently. And more recently, the idea of studying transition paths instead of chemical, classical chemical kinetics to investigate mechanisms. And I'm sure Bill will talk about uh, at least some of these points in his talk today. Now, with all of these achievements, it may not surprise you that Bill has been honored with many distinctions. He's a member of the National Academy and the Academia Nazionale de Vinci in Rome and he's received a long list of awards, which I will not list, but I would just like to mention that they have come from very different directions, right? So ranging from the Hans Neurath Award of the Protein Society to the Gordon Hammes Lectureship of the American Chemical Society, the Max Delberg Prize from the American Physical Society and all the way to the Henry Stratton Medal from the American Society of Hematology. And I think that really illustrates the broad impact that his work has had. And I, I could go on, but I've already talked too much and I have a suspicion that Bill's talk may take a little longer than 45 minutes, so we better get started. But just a few technical points before we do. Please keep your microphone switched off to minimize background. If you have a question, please use the chat window and either put the question in there or just say, I have a question and then I'll call you in the end switch on your mic and ask your question. As usual, I would like to mention that the talk will be recorded and available on YouTube for those of you who cannot be here now. And there is one last point that I want to mention, and that's our website where you can find all the information about this webinar, including the next talk in two weeks, which will be given by Amnon Horowitz. Um, and also, we have started to collect other events on the web that may be of interest to you, um, other webinars on uh, IDPs, homeostasis, um, NMR, but also this meeting here, for instance, on nascent chains and protein folding in the ribosome that will take place in Berlin, or will take place in, not in Berlin, but take place in December. Um, but with that, uh, without any further ado, Thank you very much for joining us today, Bill, and the screen is yours. Okay, just have to find it. There we are. Here. Bill?
Okay, you can see that? Yes. Great. Well, first, Ben, thank you for the really extremely kind introduction. And uh, we all owe thanks to you and Gilad and Hagen for organizing what's turned out to be a really fantastic uh, seminar series in a very stressful time for all of us. It's a wonderful thing that we can all get together uh, to hear these uh, seminars. Um, I'm working full time now on sickle cell disease and haven't been thinking uh, very much about protein folding since I visited the Weizmann uh, two years ago. Uh, so I'm a little bit rusty. Uh, so please, uh, please bear with me. One of the nice things about giving a seminar from home that my wife Gertrude just brought me a nice cup of coffee, which you can't do usually in a, it's standing at a lectern. So the title of my seminar is Modern Kinetics of Protein Folding. It's a retrospective. So by that, I mean, it's a, what I'm going to give you is a brief history of two of the advances in experimental protein folding kinetics from my lab, uh, which will provide the background for what I regard as a, a remaining major uh, experimental challenge. So I have to apologize. Uh, Many people in this audience have contributed to the modern kinetics of protein folding, especially our three hosts. Um, so I'll apologize at the outset for not mentioning uh, all of the people uh, who have made significant contributions. So I'm going to tell you two stories. One is about the protein folding speed limit, and another is about a protein we studied which folds in 700 nanoseconds, which of course, when I started in the protein folding people, people would have said, well, that's impossible. No protein can fold in 700 nanoseconds. Uh, the second story is about transition paths. This is a concept that's well known to theorists, but is not very familiar uh, to experimentalists. Uh, and it's something uh, that is studied by single molecule FRED experiments. And I'll tell you about the experiments uh, from my lab. So my interest in protein folding began in the early 1990s uh, in the Soviet Union. I was at a meeting uh, in a place called Chernigolovka uh, on dynamics of proteins and glasses, uh, very near Moscow. And uh, after the meeting, I was at a cafe in Moscow uh, having vodka, a glass of vodka with my friend Peter Wallenis. And Peter said, Bill, uh, why don't you give up hemoglobin and use your fast kinetic methods to work on a hard problem. Well, I was working on a hard problem. I was working on hemoglobin. It's still a hard problem, but of course, Peter was talking about protein folding. Uh, my first protein folding meeting was actually a very important meeting organized by uh, Charlie Brooks and Ron Levy in Puerto Rico in 1993. They were performing state-of-the-art molecular dynamics simulations and we're interested in having physical chemists doing fast kinetics uh, to get interested in the problem so that they could connect their simulations to actual experimental results. So at that time, there was this huge gap, a long simulation in those days was one nanosecond, whereas the fastest folding experiments were being done were using the stop flow mixing method of Quentin Gibson, which only has about one millisecond uh, time resolution. There were not even estimates of rates for basic structural elements, such as alpha helices of the type of the amino acid composition that occurs in proteins, nothing about hairpins and nothing about disordered loops. So the question for experimentalists is how can we make measurements on time scales that overlap with the simulations? Well, the answer was obvious to those of us working with pulse lasers somehow start the reaction with a pulse laser. So the first optical triggering experiment we did was actually on the rate of disordered loop formation by photo dissociating the carbon monoxide complex of cytochrome C. <clears throat> this experiment was not my idea, it was the idea of Heiner Roeder. Uh, Heiner was uh, visiting the NIH to give a seminar and he told me about a property of cytochrome C that I was unfamiliar with. I knew a lot about cytochrome C because 
my PhD thesis was on cytochrome C, both the physical chemistry and the spectroscopy. But Heiner pointed out that when cytochrome C is unfolded by chemical denatured, there's, there's a huge shift to the left that carbon monoxide makes the protein much less stable by binding to the heme group in the unfolded state. It can't bind to the heme group in the folded state. And that shifts the folding, uh, unfolding equilibrium towards the unfolded state which means that one could, a laser that photodissociates the carbon monoxide at about 4.5 molar guanidinium chloride could induce folding. Uh, and I knew from experiments in Robin Huckstrasser's lab where we published a paper together on his picosecond spectrometer in 1978, that carbon monoxide photodissociates in less than 10 picoseconds. So, Heiner's ex in Heiner's experiment, we had uh, time resolution to burn. So the idea of the experiment is shown here in the schematic with the CO bound to the heme. We photodissociated it with a 10 nanosecond laser pulse. The, um, the, the, unfortunately, the carbon monoxide recombines to the heme before the protein folds. So we actually never saw the protein fold. If we were redoing the experiment today, following the laser pulse, we would have turned on a CW laser to allow the C to keep the CO off the heme and allow the protein to completely fold. But what we did see using a time resolve spectrometer built by Jim Hoffrichter with a beautiful analysis by uh, Eric Henry using one of the first applications of singular value decomposition to kinetic data, what we saw was that the methionine, the native methionines, 60 residues apart, bound to the heme in about 40 microseconds. So this is the formation of a disordered loop. Now we knew from Dave Turumali's polymer physics studies on polypeptides that the fastest forming loop would be about 10 residues, not shorter because the, of the stiffness of the chain. Uh, it actually, the loop takes longer when it gets shorter than 10 residues. And we used a length scaling from Sabo, Schulten, and Schulten's 1980 paper on mean first passage times of end of the three halves to, to estimate that a, a 10 residue loop would form at about a microsecond. And that was the number we had in this paper as the fastest time a protein could possibly fold would be to form a short loop. Andy McCammon actually was the one who called it the speed limit in his uh, commentary in our PNAS article. So this experiment is what started the subfield of what I'm, was called fast folding kinetics and what I'm renaming today as the beginning of modern protein folding kinetics because it was using laser pulses. But we needed a, a more generic method. The most useful fast folding method has turned out to be nanosecond laser T-jump because it only requires that the temperature increase changes the population of folded and unfolded molecules. That it is that the folding reaction had an enthalpy change. So at the elevated temperature, we could look at the kinetics of the relaxation to the new equilibrium distribution of the folded and unfolded states. Four groups had the same idea roughly simultaneously and, and built laser T-jump app uh, instruments. The first publication came from Robin Huckstrasser, which was Robin's custom to always be the first in a new kind of experiment. Uh, he published an experiment on jumping the temperature with a 70, at 70 picoseconds using a dye that doesn't emit photons, but absorbs all the energy to produce heat in the solution to study the unfolding of RNase A. Now, what he did was he, to, to study the kinetics, he, you split a picosecond pulse into, a, into an excitation and a probe pulse, and then you use delay lines, taking advantage of the speed of light to run the laser pulse up and down your, your optical table to enter the sample at a given time later, depending on how long it's traveled, using the speed of light to determine uh, the time. And he could unfortunately build a delay line at that time. It only went to about three nanoseconds. That meant that he was really limited and he did see some changes, but it certainly wasn't the unfolding of 
ribonuclease, which takes many orders of magnitude longer to unfold at the temperature he was working. So the first uh, alpha helix for experiment was done by Brian Dyer with 10 nanosecond pulses. Martin Grubler published the same year, studying apomyoglobin folding with 10 nanosecond pulses. And our first experiments were on the uh, an alpha helix, a beta hairpin on an instrument built by uh, Peggy Thompson, also with 10 nanosecond laser pulses. So the first peptide we studied was one of Susan Marcus's alanine base peptides where to solubilize the polyalanine, you decorate it with a charge group here, it was decorated with arginines. And with a, we inserted a protonated histidine and a tryptophan into the helix in order to have a probe where the fluorescence of the tryptophan is quenched by electron transfer to the protonated histidine when this part of the helix forms. And this experiment, we saw a relaxation of about 300 nanoseconds, which assuming a two-state model meant that the folding time is about 400 nanoseconds, similar to what Brian Dyer had measured a year earlier and published a year earlier. Uh, the interesting result from this, uh, this kind of experiment came a couple of years later when Juri Guri Joss came to the lab and he did an extremely careful study of the viscosity dependence of helix and hairpin formation using glucose and sucrose as viscogens, but at an extremely low concentration so that he did not affect the equilibrium constant at all, or even the activation energy. So he only worked between one and three centipoids. But what he saw was that in a log-log plot, instead of being the, the rate being inversely proportional to the first power of the viscosity, it was proportional to a fractional power of about 0.6. So in, in Kramer's hydrodynamic theory, uh, the rate should be inversely proportional to the first power. So could this be internal friction? Uh, something that we raised in a conformational relaxation study with Enjim Ansari many years earlier, or was it actually a breakdown of Kramer's hydrodynamic theory where there's an assumption that the barrier crossing, the water relaxation keeps up with the barrier crossing. Uh, it turns out from theory and simulations by Peter, Robert Best, and Roland Metz several years later that the fractional exponent actually comes from a breakdown in Kramer's theory. But the temperature jump experiment I think had the biggest impact uh, was Victor Munoz's experiment on the 16 residue beta hairpin because it became a benchmark for molecular dynamic simulations. So when Victor came to the lab, he brought with him a lot of expertise on peptides. And also he knew about a beta hairpin that stayed intact in isolation from an NMR experiment that Luis Serrano had done. Now you all know that when you take secondary structures out of intact proteins that they simply fall apart. So this was unusual to have a beta hairpin uh, that stayed, in part, stayed intact. So uh, Victor studied it by temperature jump and he saw a three microsecond relaxation, which was at uh, the midpoint for the folding unfolding transition. So the folding uh, time was about uh, six microseconds, which brought it close to the range of molecular dynamic simulations at the, at the time. Um, but it also turned out to give us a lot of insights by applying landscape theory to the, to the first time. So, Victor, in addition to doing the experiments, he built an Ising-like model to explain the experimental results. And uh, we thought they were doing a good job, but Peter was on sabbatical at the NIH at the time and stopped by our office and was listening to Victor's model and suggested that Victor plot the free energy as a function of an order parameter as a reaction coordinate. In this case, it was Peter's first reaction coordinate, which is the number of native residues. And it really did give us a couple of very interesting insights into our experimental results. First, the structure at the barrier top had two hydrogen bonds. <clears throat> so the energy of the structure at the barrier top was lower than the energy 
of the completely unfolded hairpin in this model, which meant that it should have a negative activation energy, which is exactly what we observed. We of course observed a, a positive activation energy for the relaxation rate, but in a two-state model, it turned out when it's analyzed in terms of a two-state model, the activation energy was negative. But also interestingly, the folded minimum, the structure was not completely formed according to Victor's module, but the ends were frayed. And that's exactly what was observed in the NMR experiment. So after, after making this plot, both Victor and I became long lasting fans of energy landscape theory. Uh, so here it's 2003, there are many other labs that have gotten in, involved in making measurements on structural elements. Uh, Brian Dyer, Sandy Asher, Feng Gai, all made measurements on uh, helices. Victor, in addition to Victor, Feng Gai looked at hairpins. Uh, to look at disordered loops, uh, we uh, took advantage of a property of the triplet state of uh, tryptophan. So when tryptophan is uh, excited, with a laser pulse and crosses from the singlet manifold to the triplet manifold, it lands in the lowest triplet state very rapidly. And this triplet state actually lives for 40 microseconds, which means that we can watch kinetics for 40 microseconds by using simple optical absorption with a CW laser looking at triplet triplet absorption. So if we have a peptide, with a single tryptophan and a single cysteine, because cysteine quenches the triplet state of tryptophan by electron transfer also uh, 400 times faster than any other amino acid, any quenching of the tryptophan triplet of the tryptophan triplet state in such a peptide would be caused by contact formation uh, with the cysteine shown here. So this is a two-step uh, a picture of the mechanism where there's diffusion limited contact followed by quenching. And by studying the viscosity dependence of this reaction, we can disentangle the diffusion limited rate from the quenching rate. And we uh, get information also on the persistence length of the peptide by, uh, by, this, uh, by uh, determining the uh, quenching rate. Now, we don't see your slides move, uh, shifting. Yeah, the slide seems to be stuck. We still see the landscape slide. Pardon me, say this again. We still see the landscape slide, the, the GB1 hairpin slide. You don't see this one? No, we don't see the contact formation slide. Oh, terrible. Okay, let me just go out. That's amazing, Ben. We've tried every <laughs> rehearsal of this PowerPoint presentation. So what do you see now? Still your hairpin slide. You still just see the hairpin slide. Yeah, Gilad, the same for you? Yeah. yeah. Yes, we will try to unshare and share again. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Stop screen sharing and share again, Bill. Yeah. That normally works. What do you see now? We're Doesn't waiting. It, 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 it starts screen sharing now. In a second, we will know. Do you see anything yet? No, we are still waiting for starting the screen sharing. Doesn't sound normal, I would say, but it takes too long. Right. Yeah. It says double click to enter full screen mode. Maybe uh, Bill has to click something. Um, no, you don't see anything yet. Not yet. No, no, no. No. Now. now we do. Now we do. All right. So I was describing this slide about loop formation. So you heard what I said, I think that tryptophan has this long-lived triplet state, lasts for 40 microseconds. So if you have a peptide 
with a single cysteine and a single tryptophan because cysteine quenches this triplet state 400 times faster than any other amino acid. When the triplet state is quenched, it's because it's made a contact with the cysteine. So by studying the viscosity dependence, we can get the diffusion limited rate and the quenching rate and equilibrium constant, which gives us information about the persistence length of the chain. So many other groups got into the act, Werner Now, Thomas Kiefhaber, Harry Gray, Jay Winkler. And for residues between 10 and 100 residues, what they collectively found was loop formation takes between 10, 100 nanoseconds and one microsecond. But the interesting result, especially from, from Werner Now's studies, was that except for peptides that are rich in glycine or proline, the, the loop formation rate is, is essentially insensitive to composition. And this was very important as an ingredient uh, in our theoretical model for protein folding. So we turn to this question again, how fast can a protein possibly fold, which Andy McCammon called the speed limit with this new information. So we now know the rough time scales for helices, uh, hairpins and loops. So the argument for the speed limit is that it's determined by the rate of the slowest forming stable element, which for a helical protein would be a half a microsecond or for a beta protein, five microseconds. So another argument, which is a theoretical speed limit is reached when the barrier disappears. So if you have a theory for, uh, that calculates the free energy, activation free energy, then you can then determine the pre-exponential factor, which means when the free energy barrier disappears, the pre-exponential factor becomes the folding time. And this was done for proteins of residues, about 100 residues uh, by uh, Peter and by Victor Munoz uh, to arrive at a pre-exponential factor of 10 to the minus six seconds or one second. There was another interesting ingredient then uh, to this problem from Henri Orlan, who followed up on some work on homopolymer <coughs> collapse by Pierre de Gen to, to calculate that the, the collapse uh, time uh, scales as the uh, linearly with the number of, uh, of residues. So what this led to was a dinky little equation which is my guesstimate, I think is good to better than a factor of 10, <clears throat> that the fastest a protein folding, that a fastest time a protein can fold is N over hundred in microseconds, where N is the number of residues where we expect alpha proteins to fa fold faster than beta proteins. So this concept motivated the search for fast folding proteins and to engineer proteins to make them fold even faster. In 2004, I made a list of uh, ultra-fast uh, folding proteins uh, for a, a current opinions in structural biology that David Baker and I edited and I classified proteins that folded um, at 100 microseconds as ultra-fast folding proteins. So uh, for example, um, uh, Martin Grubla took a, the a lambda repressor, which folded in 250 microseconds and made a couple of mutations to fold it at about 18 microseconds. And there were several more proteins that all folded at that time, less than hundred microseconds. But all of them, uh, according to my speed limit, they could all be increased by more than uh, an order of magnitude, presumably by protein engineering. Um, at um, about that time, uh, Jan Kubelka uh, came to the lab uh, and wanted to work on fast folding proteins. And so he picked the villain headpiece subdomain, which he worked on for several years. Um, and he picked it because it was only 35 residues. So we could make it by peptide synthesis, which means we could make any old mutation we'd like. We could even put in abnormal amino acids. And it, it was the smallest naturally occurring sequence that behaves like a typical uh, two-state 
uh, single domain protein. It was shown by experiments by Kim and McKnight. And we were very fortunate. His first experiment showed that it's a really fast folding protein. The relaxation time was three microseconds. And in a two state analysis, it turned out the folding time was four microseconds, which at that time was the fastest known folding protein. <clears throat> um, because of our interest in this protein, we wanted to uh, have a really uh, good structure for the protein. There was an NMR structure, but my colleague Ad Bax didn't think it was a really good structure for the kind of things we wanted to know. So I convinced my uh, colleague in the Laboratory of Molecular Biology upstairs in Building 5 at the NIH to have Thang Chu as postdoc determine the X-ray structure to one angstrom resolution. And what he saw in this structure, which I get, we, we could have seen by the NMR structure also, uh, is two repulsive interactions between lysines and arginine and between the lysine and our protonated histidine. So the obvious mutation to make to speed things up is remove these, remove these repulsive interactions. And we did it simply by clipping off the positive charges off the end of the lysine by mutating them to an amino acid called norleucine. Norleucine has the same aliphatic side chain as lysine, but it doesn't have a charged amino group at the end terminus. And it did stabilize the protein significantly as shown by the CD data. But interestingly, we got all the increase in stability, we got lucky was almost exclusively in the folding rate so that the folding time when extrapolated to no uh, denatured at all was 720 nanoseconds. So that's the origin of the, uh, I think it probably is still the world record holder, I don't know. I've been followed the literature that carefully for the past couple of years, but interestingly, it still hasn't reached the speed limit, which according to my little formula should be about 350 nanoseconds. So there's more mutations to make in this protein. It's be, it, it folds so fast that uh, VJ Pandey gave it the name uh, supervillain. So we made many additional equilibrium and kinetic measurements uh, uh, by Jan and uh, uh, Troy Selmer that provided data that could be explained by Victor's Munoz Victor Munoz's isine like model, which he extended to proteins from the beta hairpin, uh, that and, and his model enumerates all 10 to the fifth microstates uh, and was expanded and refined uh, by my colleague uh, Eric Henry. There's not enough time in this seminar to go through the model. I'll just say one important postulate of this model. Um, which that a key assumption of the model or postulate is that it's only necessary to explicitly consider native interactions, which is the perfect funnel of uh, Peter and, and Jose. And this was support, strongly supported, I believe, by analysis of David Shaw's all atom simulations that were analyzed by uh, Robert Best and Gerhard Hummer in a paper in 2013 that show non-native interactions in these nine two-state proteins that were studied by simulations played no role whatsoever in the folding mechanism. They could only affect the rates. There was one exception, which is a protein alpha-3D that Feng Gai is studied by T-Jump and Hoi Song Chung, uh, later by single molecule experiments and Stefano Piana by additional simulations Alpha-3D is a designed protein, which means it, according to Peter's minimal frustration, would be expected to have a, it's not an evolved protein. So it would have a rougher energy landscape, which would be maybe reflected in the diffusion coefficient, which is actually what Stefano Piana's uh, simulations and Hoi Song Chung's experiments show. So in, in landscape theory, this diagram shows the output of the theory, which is the mechanism. This is one thing you want to get out of a theory. 
And what I'm plotting here is the residue number from one to 35 on the y-axis and Eugene Shaktovich's uh, reaction coordinate Q, which has turned out to be the most successful reaction coordinate on the x-axis going from zero to one with the color giving you the probability that a residue is in its native conformation. So what you can see, and, and the probability is given by this color. So what you can see is that uh, in this diagram, that on average, uh, the order of helix formation is helices one and two form first, followed by helix three. Peter called this uh, 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 mechanism, uh, this mechanistic theory, this, this, this model of Victor Munoz and Eric Henry, he called it the Huckel theory of protein folding. And when um, he first told me that uh, I was a little bit insulted, I thought he was making fun of our theory. But then he told me this morning when I talked to him that he really wasn't making fun, that he thought it wasn't all that bad. I mean, after all, Huckel theory dominated molecular orbital theory early on by explaining pi electron uh, properties. It did a beautiful job of explaining pi to pi transitions. Of course, nobody would use uh, Huckel theory today to do quantum chemical calculations. And I, su I suspect that our theory will have the same fate when a more realistic theory uh, comes along in the future, I hope. So uh, what, what theory tells us is that uh, proteins fold by multiple paths, not this, and all we could tell from the landscape theory was the sort of the average uh, path, uh, but the determination of the number of paths can only be obtained uh, from simulations uh, or single molecule experiments. And this, uh, uh, raises a question that uh, uh, Peter and I brought up in our response to uh, Walter Englander's assertion that uh, proteins fold by single pathways when we pointed out in uh, this uh, letter about Walter's article that at the level of atom-atom distances or, or dihedral angles of individual residues, no two molecules can possibly fold by exactly the same path, or maybe there's an, an infinitesimal possibility that they can fold by exactly the same path. The number of paths that, <clears throat> that you want to think about really depends on the level of coarse grading. And this is a point that Christoph Lindorf Larsen made when he was first analyzing uh, his simulations with David Shaw's uh, Anton. So the natural coarse graining for um, uh, our uh, villain subdomain is the order of the helices. Uh, so all of the information though on mechanism is contained uh, in the transition path. And as I said at the very outset, this is unfamiliar to uh, most experimentalists and it's a single molecule property and can only be observed experimentally by single molecule experiments. So this takes me to my second story, which is about transition paths and single molecule FRET experiments. So let me just tell you briefly what's meant by a transition path by considering a two state protein where we're using Eugene's Q as the reaction coordinate and following and say an MD trajectory in time where the Q is high when it's folded and it's low when it's unfolded and it's bouncing back and forth uh, between these two states here. It, uh, it starts to climb the barrier, falls back down. And in a landscape picture, what's going on is that this jump is this uh, uh, barrier crossing. Now in conventional kinetics, the folding time is just the average of the exponentially distributed waiting times uh, or the or what's called the waiting time or residence time in the unfolded in the unfolded well and the folding time is just the average of the exponentially weighted distribution of of uh, the waiting times in uh, the folded state so 
the, uh, the barrier crossing is actually the transition, is this, uh, is the transition path. It's the rare event when the protein actually folds. So it's the most important segment of the trajectory because it contains all of the information on how a protein folds and unfolds because here it's wandering around the unfolded state and all the mechanism about how this protein folds is contained in this jump, which in this landscape picture is a trajectory which leaves some position along the reaction cord near the unfolded well and reaches the folded well without ever returning to the unfolded well using either Peter's, uh, Peter's reaction coordinate or Eugene's reaction coordinate. So I'm gonna show you an example from an oil atom simulation uh, from the Shaw group, uh, which gives the order of uh, helix formation. Uh, this is now a 310 nanosecond segment, which is uh, of a, of a, uh, a longer, long trajectory. The transition path is going to be the middle third of this video. And what you'll see in this middle third, which is the transition path, is that the gold helix is going to form, form first. So the first third, the protein is unfolded. The second third, the protein is on a transition path as defined by Q. And the final third, the protein is fully folded. So here the protein is still unfolded. Now it's on a transition path and the gold helix is formed. And actually in this, it stays formed all through the transition path. And now the protein is in the final third and all the helices are formed. So, so the question is how many different paths are observed in the simulation? It's actually not a trivial analysis. Um, Robert Best actually analyzed the 25 transition paths that were observed in the Shaw simulations, which used 40 days of Anton one and were published in, uh, in their 2012 paper. The, um, so what you see is in fact, that all six uh, transition paths are observed. So uh, if you wanna call a helix a fold-on uh, and it's the order of fold-ons, all six are observed. But the most frequently observed are, as we observed with the landscape analysis of our theoretical model, the first and second helices form before the others. Eric Henry took the uh, Ising-like theoretical model, which had uh, almost 100,000 microstates and therefore 100,000 differential equations in the master equation. And he simulated uh, these 100,000 equations using stochastic kinetics, uh, where the rate for going from one microstate to another was given by a linear free energy relationship and the probability of going from one state I to a state J is just given by the ratio of the rate of that transition to the sum of the rates for all possible transitions to connected states. And in just hours, he was able to obtain, uh, observe 10 to the six uh, transition pairs. And again, uh, not as impressively as the MD because two and three actually uh, uh, crept in here, but also the dominant pairs were the first and second helix, the second and first helix, uh, and here the second helix before the third uh, helix. Uh, so the modern definition, my modern definition of a protein folding mechanism is the distribution of transition paths. Now you have to realize the transition state is only one position along the transition path, albeit it's the one that determines rates, so therefore it's a very, very important position, but it's only one position. To really understand the mechanism and how structure evolves, you wanna see the entire transition path. So for the villain subdomain, uh, we do have a very good idea of the mechanism by sim uh, MD simulations. 
And one of the things that has driven my research in comparison with simulations from the beginning, that if one has a sufficient number of transition paths, or namely a long enough trajectory, that the simulation, if it's accurate, it contains everything that you would ever, ever want to know about the mechanism for a specific protein. And of course, what we'd like to do, we'd also like to have a theoretical model that gives the same result of the theoretic as the simulations. And the advantage of a theoretical model is the assumptions of a theoretical model, or the importance of a theoretical model, is the assumptions of the model point to the essential features of folding mechanisms. So our, our villain subdomain is a really good example for such an analysis because we have an enormous number of different measurements that were made in my lab, um, uh, other than the heat capacity data uh, on circular diprosome, fluorescence, ra uh, radius of gyration, Phil Antrin has been measuring uh, small angle X-ray scattering versus temperature in the nature and ensemble kinetics by T-jump, uh, triplet, triplet, uh, uh, tri triplet quenching, we have rates versus denaturant, temperature, viscosity, we even measured a few vi five values. Uh, and our model uh, gives us an average water helix formation by landscape analysis, and also from stochastic kinetics, uh, we get uh, a distribution of tr uh, transition paths. The question is, what can, what can we get from experiments? Well, as I said at the outset, it's a single molecule property, so we have to do single molecule experiments. Uh, now, single molecule experiments, as uh, Ben and Gilad and Hagen can tell you, they can be really hard. So why do single molecule experiments? They've, they've been, a lot of them have been criticized in the, in the path by people who say, well, you're just doing an experiment, a hard experiment where we could get the same answer from, uh, from ensemble experiments, which are much easier. But that's not true if you're interested in transition paths because it can only be determined in a single molecule experiment. And eventually, um, I think it's going to be the absolutely the most demanding test of both theoretical models uh, and simulations. But it's going to take a while, as you'll see, we have a long way to go. Um, there's no structural information as yet on transition paths. And even the duration of transition path, of a transition path, was not previously observed for any molecular system before our work. And this is kind of unusual in science. Usually, uh, physicists do something that physical chemists pick up on, uh, and then biophysical chemists pick it up from the physical chemists. But it's very rare that biophysical chemists do a new kind of physics experiment for the first time. So I had to learn about a single molecule Fred experiments. I became intrigued listening, uh, discussing a, an ACS poster with uh, Tychip Ha in 1997, when he showed molecules jumping around on a glass surface because the orientation of their electric dipole transition moment was changing. And I just became intrigued by that as did uh, many other people, especially after uh, type chip also did the first single molecule FRED experiment to show that you could do single molecule FRED at the single molecule level. Uh, so my experiments began when Everett Lipman and Ben Schuler showed up in the lab. Everett Lipman had all the skills to build an instrument and Ben Schuler knew everything about proteins and protein folding. So it was a very good combination. Their first experiment was a free diffusion experiment in which uh, when the protein is folded and the donor and acceptor dyes are close together, if you excite this green emitting dye with a blue laser, most of the excitation energy is transferred by forcer excitation dipole dipole energy transfer to the acceptor, which emits red photons. Uh, whereas when the protein is unfolded and you excite the green emitting dye with a blue laser, uh, some of the uh, emission now comes out of the donor because the acceptor is much farther away and you see both donor and acceptor photons 
in a typical experiment, what you see are bursts of photons as molecules diffuse into the volume of a confocal micro, the illumination volume of a confocal microscope. And for bursts that are large enough that are statistically significant, you calculate a fret efficiency from the burst to determine whether the molecule is folded or unfolded just by counting the number of acceptor photons divided by the total number of photons, acceptor uh, plus donor. Well, the first step toward observing transition paths was to observe folding, unfolding trajectories, which happened after Ben left the lab when he collaborated with uh, Gilad Haran to measure the first folding, unfolding trajectories. Uh, Gilad had developed this clever method of uh, isolating a protein to, to actually uh, measure trajectories in a lipid vesicle, but uh, to make the dimensions more realistic, now this is the molecule relative to the vesicle size. Uh, and they observed uh, beautiful unfolding, uh, refolding trajectories. Here's acceptor photons, donor photon. They calculate the fret efficiency, which goes up and down. And they, in this work, they realized the importance of measuring a transition path time. Now, there were all, they were only detecting about five photons per millisecond. So they really couldn't say very much about the transition path time, except it had to be much less than the photon interval. You actually need several photons to, uh, uh, to uh, obtain a transition path time. But in any event, uh, just sort of hand waving, they did get an interesting result by saying that it takes less than 200 microseconds with a with a protein that folds in a second, it already showed that the transition path time is enormously uh, faster than the folding time, more than 5,000 times faster. Uh, so the first measurements were made when Hoi Song Chung uh, came to the lab, where he measured a large number of trajectories, about 1,200 trajectories of a protein that he immobilized with a Streptotin, streptavidin biotin uh, linkage and worked at very high intensities where the uh, average detection uh, was 650 photons per millisecond instead of five fully, uh, five uh, photons per millisecond. The downside is that the dyes would bleach. So you could only look at very short trajectories, which meant even though this was a hundred microsecond folder, um, uh, we only, even adding viscogen to slow things down, we only observed about uh, transitions between the folded and the unfolded state in about half the transitions. So uh, I'm going to have to go out of the uh, uh, presentation mode to show you this slide because it's another one where PowerPoint has failed me. So what I'm showing here is uh, a, a trajectory where, you, where you're observing the acceptor and the donor fluorescence where there are about equal number of acceptor and donor photons. But then uh, there's a transition in this yellow region to the folded state where there are more acceptor photons uh, uh, than donor photons. So what Hoising did was we knew the transition path was somewhere in this region between the unfolded and the folded states. So we cut out this region to do a photon by photon analysis using a maximum likelihood method by, uh, uh, that was developed by uh, Irina Gopich and uh, Attila Sabo. Uh, so I'm gonna go back into the display mode. Uh, okay, the presentation mode. So, the idea of their method is, this is their likelihood function, which is a product of matrices that analyzes a sequence of photon colors uh, and the interval between photons. Um, is there a menu at the top of the screen that's floating in and out, by the way? Because there is on my computer, but I guess it's, hopefully it's not on yours. In any event, okay. the um, uh, given a kinetic model, uh, the method yields the parameters of the model that's most consistent with the photon trajectory. So the kinetic model we made up for a two-state system where at equilibrium, 
And at all times in actual kinetic measurements, in conventional kinetic measurements, you only see unfolded molecules and folded molecules. We introduced a virtual state, which we called S, which rapidly goes from uh, uh, this, this virtual state rapidly decays to the folded state or the unfolded state. So it had the shaktovich grossberg property of a p-fold of one half. <clears throat> so that immediately identifies the lifetime in this model of this virtual state with the average transition path time. And uh, this is a, dis a plot which shows how we use this likelihood function. So it's, it's a little bit subtle and I'm, I'll go, I have to slow down for a second because uh, it's a bit tricky to understand what's going on. So what we're plotting here is we're plotting the value of this likelihood function for about 527 trajectory, uh, transitions uh, for an intermediate state in this kinetic model, having a lifetime tau sub s, which is our x-axis, minus the value of the likelihood function for a two-state model that has no intermediate state, which means that the transition is instantaneous. So by plotting this difference log likelihood, we're looking at the likelihood of having a model with a transition state with a transition path time, an average transition path time given along the x-axis here on a log scale. And what we see is we see a peak at 16 microseconds with a difference log likelihood of eight, which is, means that it's a 3000 fold more likely that a two state model with a finite transition path describes the photon trajectories better, 3000 times better than a two state model with an instantaneous transition. Now the experiment was carried out just to slow things down to make it easier to resolve with a viscogen at about 10 centipoise. But in a separate experiment, Hoi Sung showed that this old beta structure, that the rate is linearly dependent on the uh, viscosity with an exponent of one. So we could say from this experiment that the average transition path time in the absence of any viscogen is about two microseconds after our viscosity correction. Now it turns out that the more interesting result actually is possibly when he looked at protein GB1, which is a one second folder where he saw no peak, okay? and had to look at 48,000 molecules to detect 114 transitions. So it was a really heroic experiment by Hoi Sung to detect these 114 transitions. And what this plot is showing you is that this is the 95%, this dashed red lines, 95% confidence limit at times longer than about 10 microseconds Hello. It is unlikely, Hello. highly unlikely, Hi, my nigga. that there's a transition and that there's an intermediate state in Black our, Lives Matter. Um, well, that yes. there's a transition intermediate state in our uh, trajectory is a lifetime longer than 10 microseconds. So, Ben, what's going on here? There's a lot Suck of people. My dick, my dick. Oh, yeah. writing. It's Russian Federation. Okay. It's Donald Trump. I'm frozen. Okay, I hope I got them all. I kicked, I kicked them out. Um, wow. 
I've seen everything happen in Go Sedar. back to uh, Russia. Vodka. Vodka. I like vodka and life. beer. I like vodka and beer. Suko bla. Ila, do you see them? Yeah. I kick them out right whenever, I, whenever I see them. So I, I'll yeah, try. Yeah, to same talk. with me. So, boss, boss Hagen, boss Gilad, boss Ben, did you shut everybody up? Yeah, we're 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 on our way. Uh, <laughs> but there quite a, there were quite a number of them, um, yeah. so we had to kick them out one by one. And can, can people, please shut up. Say again, sorry, Bill. No, I'm just telling people mute your. Oh yeah, yeah, right. So these were attackers. Yeah. Uh, it, looks, it looks like we, we got them all out. Peter, you did very well. Good. All right. Okay. Yeah. So, did I make my last point that that for GB one, the one second folder, what we can say is that the transition path time has to be less than 10 microseconds. All right, it won't advance. Screen sharing has stopped as the shared window, right? Can you share again? I'm going to try sharing again. Mm -hmm. um, I think you have a problem. No one just joined in Russian. Yeah. So, um, I had the lights go out on me once when I was giving a lecture at a biophysical society meeting. Uh, the lights went out in the auditorium and it was black <laughs> for 10 minutes. I was giving a lecture, I remember in Sweden when the slide projector broke. I have many, many stories, but somebody writing on my slide in a webinar is gonna, it's gonna be hard to top that one. <laughs> so in any event, this is, the, this is the summary of the result that a, a slow folding protein and a, fo a fast folding protein fold in almost the same time. Uh, the transition path time is almost the same, even though they differ by a factor of 10,000 in their folding rates. Well, this made David Shaw happy because even though it wasn't exactly the same WW domain, uh, he was after a viscosity correction for his tip three water, his average transition path time was 1.5 microseconds. Um, maybe it made Martin Rubla happy because he did a clever experiment where he had a 10 microsecond WW domain folder. Again, a slightly di a a different one with a, with a low barrier such that there was a population of molecules at the top of the barrier. So when he jumped the temperature, the molecules fell off the barrier top and actually it's the same model we use to analyze our single molecule experiments. And he got an average transition path time of uh, 1.5 microseconds. So the surprise then, as I said, was that a fast and a slow folding protein take almost the same time to fold when the folding actually happens, which is the transition path. But this is no surprise to theorists. The results readily explained by Attila using uh, Wallen and Sonichik 1D landscape theory, which is a barrier crossing by a single Brownian particle. The, the Karmers told us that the folding time depends exponentially on the activation on the free energy barrier height. Attila's formula shows that it depends logarithmically, which means it's essentially relative to the folding uh, time. It's insensitive to the height of the barrier. Um, and if you use the same curvatures and the same diffusion coefficients in these formulas uh, for the two proteins, then it, if Attila's formula predicts that we should only see a, a 1.4 fold difference for
for uh, the slow folding and the fast fo folding protein that we studied. So the challenge for uh, future experiments, uh, which I said at the outset of this seminar, is to observe uh, individual transition paths. That is, we want to see uh, in experiments what's seen in the ND simulations and what comes from the Ising-like uh, model. Uh, uh, but to get structural information will require uh, uh, at least three color fret to make measurements during a transition path to get 3D structural information by using uh, alternating excitation. I think Shimon Weiss was the first to do this where you excite the donor, uh, which can transfer excitation energy to two different acceptors, but then to disentangle the data, you have to excite uh, the, the acceptor with a different uh, uh, laser pulse, uh, which can only transfer energy to the uh, second acceptor. And there is, uh, there are experiments moving in that direction. This is a three color experiment that just been published in science by my colleagues, Hoi Song Chung and Irina Gopich on coupled and binding of a disorder, intrinsically disordered protein binding to its partner. And in this experiment, they showed that there are multiple pathways uh, for binding for the disordered protein. So I guess the main take home message uh, from this seminar is that uh, new technologies can and often produce new science. Uh, and uh, this is a plug for my colleague at Bax and Phil Anfenroot. There's emerging technology in the laboratory of chemical physics. Uh, at Bax is harnessing the power of NMR to obtain atomic level detail on folding mechanisms by millisecond pressure jump with uh, Phil, an apparatus that Phil Edford would built where they can jump the pressure and release the pressure in a millisecond to watch a protein fold on the millisecond time scale. And they do this thousands and thousands of times in order to do the necessary averaging because of, of course the weak NMR signals where you need multiple jumps to, uh, to obtain uh, any data at all. So the work that I've told you about, has been done by a bunch of key postdoctoral fellows. I'm listing them here in chronological order. Almost all of them have gone off uh, to uh, faculty positions at uh, research universities, except for these three lucky guys, Troy Selmer, Robert Best, and Hoi Song Chung, who actually have position, permanent positions in the laboratory of chemical physics. Uh, and uh, of course, a lot of the work I've talked about has been done in collaboration with senior investigators uh, in the lab. Robert Best is now a senior investigator, Arena Gopich, Eric Henry, Gerhard Hummer, who was in the lab and off, went off to the Max Planck Institute, Jim Hafrichter, who built the nanosecond instrument, and uh, Attila Sabo, just about every aspect of the problem. So I have to thank all the brilliant theorists outside the NIH for numerous extremely valuable discussions that have made it enormous fun to work on protein folding for 25 years. They're all now my close friends, Gerhard Hummer, Roland Netz, Jose Onichik, Henri Orland, Eugene Shaktovich, Dave Tarumalai, and uh, especially Peter, who introduced me uh, to, the, to the subject and got me to work on protein folding. And I mentioned Madras here for Dave Tarumalai because Dave Tarumalai was born in the same city as the mother of our new vice president, Kamala Harris. So he could be very influential in this upcoming uh, administration. Okay, after a few uh, transient disasters, I'm done and um, thank you for listening in. I'm, I'm happy to answer any questions, as long as they're easy ones. Thank you very much, Bill, for this wonderful journey through the modern kinetics of protein folding. And sorry for the disruption. This has only happened to us once, and so we thought we we're no longer an attractive target, but maybe we'll really have to take safety measures there. So. I can see there are already questions. Um, so the, the first one that I can see here is from 
Stephen Fried, can you unmute yourself and ask your question? Yeah, no, thank you very much, Ben. And thank you so much, uh, Bill, for a really beautiful talk and for a lot of context and history in the field. I have a, a question that maybe doesn't have like a, um, a super well-defined answer. So I'm kind of curious to hear maybe your opinion on it. So for proteins that fold much slower than the ones that I guess have been the focus of the studies that you've described, um, would you speculate that these are ones that just simply have higher activation barriers and so it just takes more exploring for them to get to that sort of like transition region or these ones where just like their fold is more complex and so it's more likely for it to go down the wrong way before it, you know, picks itself back up and then goes down the right way. How would you sort of like contextualize you know, these like much slower folding proteins in the context of the studies that you have uh, pioneered? Well, the answer to the first part of your question is it's because they have higher free energy barriers. Okay, and why they have higher free energy barriers is a question for looking at the mechanism in more detail. Uh, the, the barrier in protein folding, I mean, one of the major results uh, that came out of Peter's work is that it's basically an entropic barrier. So it could be that the structure is really, really complicated and there's a lot more that has to be explored in order to reach that transition state. So uh, it's, it's, it's gonna be a question of entropy, but then to really give a more specific answer, you'd, you'd have to look at, uh, now it can be done. I mean, there are Markov state models that uh, are, are Frank Noe and other people are working on which are taking MD simulations and they're making transition matrices from which they can then look at the kinetics at very long times, okay? Um, and that's, I think that's where you're gonna get the answer for these slow folding proteins, uh, why they're slow, but I don't have any really smart answer to the question. So maybe I can add a question of something that you mentioned at the beginning. Um, what would you consider the, the greatest challenges in, in protein folding now? Uh -huh. Well, I, I pointed out what I thought was the greatest exp the great experimental challenge. Are you now asking me what I think the big theoretical challenge is? Yeah, overall. <laughs> well, okay, well, you know, we can, we can split it into parts. There's, uh, there's challenges for simulations, there's challenges for experiments, and there's challenges for theory. I think we have uh, a lot of the basic principles of protein folding, and for many people, that's really the most important theoretical answer is to, is to, is to obtain principles. But as far as uh, mechanism goes, and I did mention this in my, um, in my talk, I think you want a, a theoretical model that's more realistic than this Ising-like model uh, because the assumptions and postulates of theoretical models really point to the important features of, 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 of protein folding. And, and I think there'll be new principles to be discovered there. The, uh, the unrealistic part of the Isi like model is it, 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 it doesn't treat the unfolded parts of the molecule well at all. For example, it doesn't treat the unfolded state. It can't even determine the simplest property of the unfolded state, which is the radius of gyration. Um, so I think it's a challenge to my smart theoretical friends who are still up on the slide here uh, uh, to, develop, to develop more realistic models that can do the same thing that uh, what uh, Victor's model did, which I didn't show you, but it does a, a fantastic job of explaining the wide variety of experimental data that I presented. And uh, I think most of
keep the passive. We, we cannot we cannot hear you, Bill. You still there? Bill got frozen somehow. Yeah. Oh, okay, I see. I'll chat him. Ah, oh, there he is. Bill, can you still hear us? Bill? Yes. Oh, there ah, you are. There you are. I'm okay. still here. We lost you for a few seconds. I know, I know. My screen went blank. Okay, so maybe we move on to the next question. There is a question by Rafael Petrosian. Uh, yes, uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. So you mentioned that the proteins can have several uh, different transition paths. Uh, does that mean that there are also different transition states and hence folding rates? And when we refer to a folding rate of a protein, do we mean assemble average of those rates? Well, for a single molecule, there is no transition state. Um, there's a transition state is a property of an ensemble of molecules. So the transition path can, I, I, so it's a bit of a subtle point because I pointed out that the, the value of Q, the reaction coordinate uh, uh, at the top of the free energy barrier in an ensemble landscape description is an important position uh, along the, the most important position possibly along the reaction coordinate. Um, so the transition state in general, I mean, just by simple arguments, transition states can be different for every molecule if you want to consider it a single molecule. And this was pointed out a long time ago that there's no single transition state. There's an ensemble of transition states. So, Maybe Peter can chime in and explain the difference in statistical mechanical thinking between single molecules and ensembles. Well, I, I think it is important that it's an ensemble and I think that even already has consequences. Uh, the five values originally were interpreted as, as a uh, distortion of the native state of a protein. But I think the success of the funnel-based calculations and your Hückel-based calculations show that the fractional phi values arise because it is an ensemble of transition states. The transition state is not a distorted version of the native state, which was the original uh, interpretation of fractional phi values. So I, I, I think to some extent, this uh, it's, it's a very interesting question, but I think it's been kind of resolved and even shown to be relevant to all the other, let's say, more uh, standard uh, chemical kinetic analysis of folding. I see, thank you. Okay, we have uh, another question by Pooja. <clears throat> Would you like to ask your question or shall I just read it? We cannot hear you, so I'll just read it. Her question is, um, does the speed of folding and unfolding depend upon the protein length? Yeah, folding speed correlates very nicely with uh, protein length. And uh, I don't know, Dave Tarumalai, Victor Munoz, a lot of people have shown a clear correlation between uh, folding rate uh, and length. There's a lot more stuff to organize, so it takes longer. Yeah. Next question, Jose Maria Delfino. You want to ask? Oh, no, I, I, I shall read it. Um, thank you very much for an insightful, marvelous talk. What is your expert view on solvent modification with additives to slow down the processes and put them in the current range of experiments, of car current experiments, might they involve unsurmountable distortions to the actual mechanisms? 
Uh, that was actually something I think I heard Bruce Byrne bring up uh, a long time ago that uh, that even if you slow the system down uh, with a viscogen, uh, you may uh, you may change if you think of it in terms of a multi-dimensional landscape, you may change the direction the system takes along along the landscape depending on uh, how rough the landscape is in different regions and how those and how that roughness is actually affected by viscosity. So in fact, increasing the viscosity uh, can slow things down to make it good for experimentalists, to make it easier for them to measure if you're looking at fast folding proteins, but it certainly can change the mechanism. And that's something that one has to be aware of. Yeah, very good. I don't see any further questions in the chat. With that, I would like to thank all of you for joining. And thank you very much, Bill, for a wonderful talk. And uh, sorry for the interruption. And have a good afternoon, good evening, and hope to see you all soon. Thanks again. Goodbye. Bye-bye, all. Thanks for listening. Bye, Bill. Bye. Thank you very much, Bill. Bye, Bill. Bye.